welcome everyone here this evening. My name's Donna Calico, and I'm the Executive Director at the Center for Public Leadership at the Kennedy School at Harvard University. Welcome to the Harvard Faculty Club. And I just wanted to congratulate and really indicate how, how proud I am to be partnering at this very, very special evening with the Michigan Ross School of Business and the Boys and Girls Clubs of Boston. But yeah. yes, <laughs> plenty of time for that. First, I want to thank the team that put this together. And from Michigan, please extend our best to Ida Faye Webster. And from the team over at CPL, Louisa Pellerin, Paulina Pe Parapelkin, and Chris Meyer, thank you so much for all of your work on this evening. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our center and our mission. It's a little bit ambitious, and it's twofold. We really want to advance the frontier of leadership, research and knowledge, and also broaden and deepen the pool of men and women who will become leaders for the common good. And we accomplish this through four, four different ways. One is through the research and teaching of our faculty. The second piece is in establishing uh, fellowships for promising leaders. That's something for all of you teens who are here thinking about, that we have that capacity here, and hope that you will consider that in your journey as you move through your career path. We also try to create leadership development opportunities and build alliances. Tonight is not just about a bestseller book, from uh, my words to God's ears, right, No. It's about leadership development, and it's about building partnerships. That's my passion, and it's what motivates me to come to work every day. And it's not really often that we at Harvard have an opportunity to connect with the greater Boston community. And to be honest with you, I don't think we do it enough. Now, I can't direct what Harvard's going to do, but I do have some control over what we can do in terms of our center at the Kennedy School. And so this night is contributing to that effort, and I really want to indicate that I think that that's, it's our storyline. It's contributing to our storyline, and I thank you all for that. Let me tell you a little about, a bit about who's in this room, besides my friends. I'll start with, first of all, that you have a mix in terms of generations, you have a mix in terms of the adult leaders in this world who are in this room who have uh, are entrepreneurial from the private sector, the nonprofit sector, and the public sector. I can tell you that if you embark on their journey and ask them what they've done throughout their lives, it went like this, and that they went back and forth between the sectors. That's that's what's happening today. That's what is going to solve the problems of our world. Then I have the Kennedy School students. And the Kennedy School students are a very, very special breed. And they really give us uh, great pride every single day. They come here to learn, to reflect, and to also try to decide how they're going to do some good. And when Noel interviewed each of them earlier in the evening, he saw that. And that is indicative of what a public service school should be about and you will see that example tonight and we're so proud to have you all here i'd like to first i'd like to ask the kennedy school students to please stand so we can acknowledge your presence thank you and last but not least we have our rising leaders, our young teens, urban teens, who have promise, who have um, a great, great life ahead of them. And we, t we talked tonight about the adults maybe being the coaches here. I would say that this is a two-way street of learning, and that I would like to ask our friends family, and all the young teens here to please stand up so we can acknowledge your presence and contribution. Thank you. Thank you. 
Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the authors, and then I'm going to share a story, and then we'll move on to uh, Noel. Okay, the first author I have to talk about is Warren Bennis. Warren Bennis is very, very dear to our center. He is not only the chairman of our advisory board, but he is one of the kindest, dearest human beings in the world. He touches people just by his mere presence. And I had hoped that he would be here with Noel in order to share this evening, uh, but that didn't happen. But I can tell you that for 82 years old, on his 28th book, he is the most incredible human being. He's also a university professor, distinguished professor of business, founding chairman of the Leadership Institute of the University of Southern California. He's served as an advisor to four U.S. presidents and is a consultant for Fortune 500 companies. He's written, as I said, 28 books, many articles on leadership change and creative collaboration, and his book, Leaders, was recently designated by the Financial Times as one of the top 50 books of all, all times. Uh, you know, Warren is only, at, Warren will say, if he was here right now, he would say that he's been successful in terms of writing books because he has always established great partner co-authors. And with that, he would say that about Noel. And Noel, as everyone, I'm going to tell you, a lot of people did a little research uh, on you before they came here. And they found out that, as, as we all know, that Noel hasn't, dedicated his illustrious career to helping companies transform their performance by embedding leadership teaching and learning at all organizational levels. Author of numerous books, articles, he provides thoughtful, actionable answers on how to develop leaders in the 21st century. Currently, he's a professor at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. Tishy pre previously served for nine years on the Columbia University Business School faculty. He's also known for his work as head of GE's Leadership Center, the fable Crottonville, where he led the transformation to action learning at GE in the mid-80s, which is still present today. Long regarded as a staple of management literacy, Tishy has been rated one of the top 10 management gurus by Business Week and Business 2.0. I'm going to close with a story, because I actually did read the book. And my story is about a gentleman called Thad Allen. Now, for those in, you, in the room, Thad Allen is formerly today Admiral Thad Allen, and he is the Coast Guard Commandant. And he's been up to um, the Kennedy School several times, and we've become pretty friendly. And he talks about going to Katrina. And I'm going to share the story of how that happened. Um, we all know Katrina and the hurricane started on a Friday, and that a lot of notifications were made. The, the uh, storm occurred on Sunday. Monday, the levees broke. Chaos. He was asked to come down. Mike Brown was the head of FEMA at that time, and he was the principal field officer. Thad Allen was called on a Wednesday by the president and asked to take over. And he says that he, at that moment, talked to his wife and he said, you know, I have no choice, I have to do this. On his way to the airport, or the Air Force, or wherever he was going, he gets on, the first thing he did was he got on the cell phone and he made five cell phone calls to five different people that he could trust and that he knew could bring the, their expertise and experience to the job. He said, I need you, and I need you there tomorrow. People. The second thing that he did when he got down there was that he said, I need everybody together, every FEMA employee, public health employee, public safety officer that's here, I need to talk to them. And they said, well, we can't get them all together. We have no way of reaching them. And he said, I don't care what you have to do I want them all together. I want to talk to them. They rounded them up. There were probably about 400 of them there. There was no communication, as we all know. I think he was using a bullhorn. And his message to them, as, as he was telling them that they were doing a good job, that they had a lot of work to do, that they were going to do it together, but his final message to them, and I'll never forget it, 
he said, they said, well, what, what are we doing when we're out there? We, we don't even know what to do. We don't have enough information. We don't have anything. Um, we don't have the, the tools in which to do it. He said, all I ask you to do is one thing. Treat everyone you meet as if they were your family. That's my message to you. And they left with that was what they had to do. Strategy. Last piece is crisis. He's in the middle of the crisis. The biggest part of the crisis was the media. He said, I can't fight the media. I've got to join the media. And if you'll recall, he accepted every offer to talk, to talk honestly, to explain what was happening, to say when he didn't know the answers. And he did that continuously and st turned the media to be not necessarily an ally, but to help him get the messages that he needed out. He is an example of a leader who exercised judgment. And I leave you with those words, and I turn now for an opportunity. Did I see my boss here? Yes, he is. <laughs> Where is he? Mr. Gergen, hiding behind a pillar. Um, I turn to David Gergen who is the director of our center. He's been a presidential advisor, mediator, commentator. If, it's kind of nerve wracking when you're flying back from a business trip and you got to see your boss on TV. You know, you really have to reflect upon that. And he's a terrific guiding vision of our center. And I'm so proud to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Donna, and thank all of you for coming for this very special evening. I especially want to uh, salute and thank the representatives from the Boys and Girls Clubs who are here. Uh, it's a wonderful organization. We've had some contact with it uh, over the years, and uh, uh, I had the opportunity to speak to the National Convention, I guess, about a year or two ago, and to know how, just how uh, uh, wonderful this organization is. Uh, and I also want to thank, uh, you know, this is sort of like... Um, uh, the meeting of Donna Calico's friends, as far as I can tell. So I want to I want to welcome all of you who are uh, friends of the Calicos and the and Donna has uh, you know from her experiences in Brookline when she was an elected official at Brookline, uh, something I've never been. Uh, she uh, she's brought her own understanding of leadership and judgment, uh, and she's brought her experience uh, to bear. So we're very proud that. Uh, uh, she's the executive director of our center. She's brought uh, you know, fresh energy and light. Thank you, Donna, for what you're doing. Thank you for your part of this. <clears throat> now, this evening does bring, uh, um, is special because uh, this book that has just been published by Noel Tishy and Warren Bennis, who is a dear friend, um, uh, on judgment um, is one that I would commend to you. I've had the opportunity to read it uh, in an earlier uh, form, uh, and it's it's very very worth your time because it uh, it's not only important about judgment, but it reflects I think a great deal of the work of uh, of Noel Tishi over the years. Uh, he's a person who's been in this leadership thinking about leadership field for a long time. He's advised many major uh, CEOs, he's advised many major corporations, and he's had a, uh, a, a long and distinguished record of working with students. Uh, and so when we heard that uh, he and Warren were collaborating, Warren is a, another guru in this field, it was a natural for us to say, well, listen, when, uh, when, when you can, would you please come to Harvard uh, and, and talk? Uh, because we would look forward to that moment. And it's actually opportune, and, and, um, and Noel and Warren, I've, I've been in communication with Warren today. The, you know, this, this whole idea of question of judgment is uh, one which is very much in play in the presidential campaign. Uh, there, as you know, especially among Democrats, but also on the Republican side, but among Democrats in particular, there's been an argument about experience. And uh, does, how much does experience count? How much experience is enough? Uh, what is the right experience? And what uh, Warren and, and, and Noel have discovered in their work is that in almost every instance, judgment trumps experience. It's the quality of judgment that actually matters. But then the question becomes, well, how do you form your judgment? Well. 
through experience. You know, so it's, uh, it is one of these, you know, conundrums about, uh, yeah, there, there, there's the old story about, you know, how, do you, how did you learn how to do what you do? Well, I made mistakes. And how did you get better? Well, I kept making mistakes, and you learn, and you learn. And, um, uh, you know, Ted Sorensen is cited in this book as uh, someone who thought a lot about judgment when John Kennedy was president. And, and we often look back and think that John Kennedy exercised during the 13 days period uh, the finest, keenest judgment of any president we've seen in a moment of crisis. Uh, but it's important to understand that not about 14 months earlier, he, dis he, he displayed about the lousiest judgment of any president we've had in the Bay of Pigs. And uh, he learned from one to the other. Now, I will just tell you, now that you're at Harvard, I'll tell you a secret about John Kennedy in the 13 days, because you ought to understand how Harvard students think. And that is that I like to teach the 13 days uh, 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 story as one of a, 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 an example of leadership and the exercise of judgment. And so uh, on occasion, I've shown 13 days of the movie uh, to a class. And I asked them to come in on a you know, Wednesday night and see this you know, sort of off class time. And so I did this a couple of years ago. And, um, and, and the next week, I asked them to write a paper about John Kennedy and his leadership. And I got a paper back from one of these hotshot Harvard students who said he was very impressed with the quality of the people that, that John Kennedy managed to assemble around him. He was especially impressed that John Kennedy had decided Kevin, to appoint Kevin Costner as one of his top assistants. <laughs> <laughs> and no, I don't know about you, but I didn't know how the hell to grade that. <laughs> I was sort of stumped. You know, is this kid pulling my leg or is this serious? I looked at it four or five times. I think he's serious. I didn't know what to do that. So with that in mind, and with that, uh, that, uh, that introduction to Harvard and judgment, I would like to turn this back over to, to Donna, but especially to welcome Noel here. Noel, it's all yours. Thank you very much. It, it's an absolute privilege and, and just a wonderful welcome from... Uh, Donna and David and the staff here, and uh, I've had a chance this afternoon to do a little warm-up show with the uh, Kennedy School graduate students and the Boys and Girls Club uh, students. And so uh, those of you who know me know that every event in my life is a workshop. So you have come to a workshop, not to some author up here blah, blah, blahing about their book. And uh, just two little anecdotes. Warren Bennis my co-author and I actually had an interesting start in our careers. In 1967, I was a senior at Colgate University, and the great Warren Bennis, who was pretty famous at that time, had left MIT to start a doctoral program at SUNY Buffalo, the Applied Behavioral Science Program. And I was all excited about, I, I want to go to that doctoral program. And it's not very close. Hamilton, New York, and Buffalo, New York are not very close. It's a long drive. And I got an interview with the great Warren Bennis. And at the end of the interview, he looks at me and says, young man, you're very impressive, but don't bother applying. That was a very long drive back. <laughs> and that was the start of my relationship with Warren Bennis. Thank God uh, he left to be president of the University of Cincinnati the next year. The doctoral program never happened. And uh, I thank God I went to Columbia University in the social psych doctoral program. And I was on a panel, actually, at Harvard. This is some Harvard connection here, about 10 years ago. And I told the story on a panel with Warren next to me. He says, no way. You had to have rejected us. He said, when you're 21 years old and some SOB rejects you, you never, ever forget it for the rest of your life. <laughs> so why we ever got together to write a book? Uh, but we've been kind of in this mutual admiration society uh, for years. And we said, you know, the one thing, as we look at all the stuff on leadership, nobody's written anything about judgment. You know, there are all these articles on here are the five easy steps to making a decision. And we look at, geez, how did Jeff Immelt, the CEO of GE, decide to spend $10 billion to buy Amersham? And it certainly wasn't a blink. You know, and if you read the book Blink, that's, I'm a social psychologist. That's a small slice of social psychology. That's, that's not how you make a $10 billion acquisition. Or that's not how you, as a board of Merrill Lynch, decide to fire Stan O'Neill or fire Chuck Prince. And so we said, you know, how do you make these big judgments? And then we decided there are only three that matter as a leader. People, who's on your team, off your team, 
strategy, what mountain do we climb, and crisis. Every so often, something happens. And then we decided, if you don't get the people one right, you can't get the others right. And we see example after example. There's plenty of bad, bad judgment examples in the book. You know, from Carly Fiorina at HP to the two CEOs, uh, the CEO misjudgments at IBM and other play AT&T and so forth. So we're, and we're very explicit about names, rank, and serial numbers just so we can understand the phenomena. And where we ended up is that judgment is a process. There's a preparation phase where you frame it, mobilize and align the right research. You make the judgment, then you have to stay with the execution. And if you don't stay with the execution, it won't happen. And rather than spend tonight talking about the book, you can all read the book, which is wonderful. One of the things I believe, and I, we end the last chapter of the book on the work we did with the New York City school system, where for three years we worked with uh, Joel Klein, the chancellor, and Bob Noling in developing leadership programs for New York City principals, is the next generation counts. And what, what do we want them to do? We want them to jo grow up with good judgment. And so we started in New York with an event like this at the McGraw-Hill building with the Boys and Girls Club. And uh, in their case, we had New York City principals and about 140 executives. We're going to do this in Chicago and San Francisco and LA. And the Boys and Girls Club are going to be part of every single event because we're now working with them on leadership development for the Boys and Girls Club. So what we're going to do tonight is run a workshop. <laughs> and uh, I, was, uh, I promised uh, Louisa I would tell this story. My, my wife will love this. Uh, my wife, Patty Stacy, is here. And uh, when we got married, she, just, she didn't, I wouldn't tell her the story. We ran a workshop. And I told her every event we have is a work. So at, at the reception, everybody at the table was given the instruction to, around the table, come up with the most embarrassing story they had about either me or Patty. And, uh, and then, you know, everybody had to present their storyline to the group. So we actually, at our wedding, had a workshop. We're going to turn this into a more useful workshop. <laughs> our Boys and Girls Club gang, where raise your hands, our young people. Not, not, no, no, you're not getting up. <laughs> you, you are not one of the, <laughs> you're not one of the high school kids. The staff, no, just the young people. We're going to give them a gift. They have spent time this afternoon thinking of questions they have to help their lives in making better judgments about people, who they hang with, who they work with in school and after school and you know they make there's some pretty tough pressures going on there and they're gonna have some questions and you're gonna give them your best advice uh, and then we'll move on to strategy what am I gonna do with my life you know one one kid in New York was I, I I'd like to go to John Jay College but this rap group is uh, asked if I want to work as a part-time manager and I'm thinking of, what do I do uh, and then the third category would be crisis and as teenagers, they tend to uncover crises very regularly. <laughs> and uh, so they've, they've done a little bit of work, and our, our colleagues from the Kennedy School have been with them this afternoon to kind of help them get ready. And so what I want to do is, is make sure, and you're going to have to maybe sort things out of the table. If you have two Boys and Girls Club young people at the table, split the table in half so that we get full attention on one Boys and Girls Club. Some of the tables have two. And so you may, you may be in trios or quartets. And uh, in a minute, I'm going to turn the floor over to the table. And the Boys and Girls Club, and it's going to be just on people judgment. And we'll go maybe about 10 minutes on as much help as you can give. And adults, you know, they've got some very clear questions about how do I make better people judgment. Give them your best coaching. And, uh, and then I'll stop action in about 10 or 12 minutes, and I'm going to pull out a few examples from our Boys and Girls Club uh, uh, young people on, on what they learned from the coaches. But you've got world-class coaches here. You ready for your coaching help? You're prepared. Okay, you're on. Uh, localize it. And I'd like all the uh, Boys and Girls Club young people to stand up. And I want to give you a challenge. Before we thank them, I want to give them a challenge. And then we're going to thank them for some of the gifts they gave us tonight. But I want to challenge each of you to go back to your Boys and Girls Clubs and be a leader and help give back to some of your colleagues and talk about what happened here. Uh, help them think about their lives 
You have an opportunity. I think everybody can be a leader. Leaders make things happen that wouldn't happen without them. It's not having a formal position. So I want to challenge you to give back from some of what happened here tonight. And I want to end, and we're going to end the evening. The Boys and Girls Club young people will be leaving us because the adults are going up to a room up there and we're having a reception, <laughs> which uh, when you get older, you'll be invited to that reception. <laughs> But why don't, we, uh, why don't we end it on our wonderful young colleagues and wish them the best, and then we'll reconvene upstairs. Thank you.